Okay, so uh, all right, I'll start. And um, so I want to talk about the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. Um, so here's a picture of showing us what it is. So it it relates uh, three different uh, types of objects. So on one side, you have holomorphic connections on a domain. So D is a subset of the complex numbers. And uh, right, so, so, okay, so this is a fancy way to say a linear ordinary differential equation. Um, but okay, so there's some something to talk about here. Um, uh, but you can think of a holomorphic connection as a linear ordinary differential equation. And then uh, complex local systems on the domain. Um, so you can think of this as local solutions to your ordinary differential equation. And uh, also finite dimensional complex representations of your fundamental group of the domain. All right, so the Riemann Hilbert correspondence is saying like these three categories are equivalent. So let me do an example of, uh, of the correspondence. So here I have a linear ordinary differential equation, um, f prime equals f over 2z. And I want to solve, uh, I want to get to the complex local system from this. So I want to find the local solutions to this ODE. So this is a separable uh, differential equation. So I can solve this like I solve uh, uh, separable equations. So you can uh, separate variables. And um, so df over f is equal to uh, 1 over 2z dz. And uh, integrate both sides. Um, and then here, uh, this is equal to 1 over 2 integral of dz over z. So this is just 1 over 2 times natural log of z plus some arbitrary constant. Right. And then you can take the exponential of both sides to see that f is equal to, um, right? So, um, right, exponential of this, uh, you're going to get c times uh, square, square root of z. Right. Okay, um, so this is uh, this is a solution for this differential equation. Um, okay, and uh, maybe I should have said earlier um, that in this example, we're going to take d to be um, the complex numbers minus zero. And uh, I'm taking this as my domain because then this equation, which has a singularity at z equals zero, is going to have uh, coefficients which are holomorphic functions on the domain. So this, this ODE only has a singularity at z equals zero. So I'm going to take my domain to be c minus zero. And then um, I've solved for this differential equation using separation of variables. Um, but, uh, but I'm looking for solutions on this domain. So a question I want to ask is, is, is there any problem with this solution? Dad, is this a branch problem? Yeah, yeah. So I, this is my domain, c minus 0. And this solution is not a solution over the entire domain, right? Um, because uh, this, this function square root of z has two branches. So it's a, a, you, ca you can only have a solution locally. You can't have a solution on the entire domain, c minus 0. Um, because uh, because then you would need to have a multi-valued function, right? So if I have uh, if uh, my domain is c minus zero and uh, square root of z uh, over each point, uh, there are two possible values that I could choose. Um, the positive, uh, like 
if uh, square root of z is one uh, value of this function, then negative square root of z is another value that you can also get for this function. And um, in order to have this well-defined, you need to choose a branch. You need to say, omit the negative axis and look at the solution on this open set, uh, c minus the negative numbers and minus zero. Um, so, so this is only a local solution. And um, we also have a one dimensional vector space of solutions at each uh, small open set. So, so this is what we mean by complex local system. Um, so in our domain, we can look at small open sets in the domain and in each of those small open sets, we have a vector space of func uh, of solutions. This is going to be a one dimensional vector space because this arbitrary constant can be anything in the complex numbers. Right. So I started with a linear ordinary differential equation, a degree one linear ordinary differential equation. And then I got a complex local system, which just means at each small open neighborhood of my domain, I am having a one dimension, uh, a vector space uh, attached to it, All right? So here I have a uh, one dimensional vector space uh, over each small open neighborhood. All right. So, okay, so we went from, uh, from this circle to this circle. So from linear ordinary differential equations to local solutions of ordinary differential equations. And uh, then uh, there's this circle, which is the finite dimensional representations of the domain uh, of the fundamental group of the domain. So the fundamental group of uh, C minus zero, this is uh, Z and it's generated by the loop that goes around uh, the origin. So this is C minus zero. And there is this loop that goes around the origin gamma. And so this is a generator for the fundamental group. And um, a representation of this fundamental group, I'm going to have a representation, a one dimensional representation of this fundamental group is going to just be a map, a ho group homomorphism from here to C star. Uh, so that's going to be a one dimensional representation because uh, uh, what is a representation? It's just a map from a group to G, L, N of C. So we're assigning matrix matrices to each element of the group and the assignment uh, preserves multiplication. Um, Right, so, uh, so a one-dimensional representation is going to be when G, we're, we're looking at GL1 of C, and this is just the one-by-one one matrices that are invertible, which is just the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. So uh, here I had a first-order linear differential equation. Here I have a one-dimensional vector space of local solutions, and here I'm looking at a one-dimensional representation of the fundamental group of my domain. Uh, and uh, I'm going to assign to this generator, uh, gamma, uh, the number negative one. So this is going to be my representation. And uh, how do I go from local, local systems or these local solutions to my uh, representation? Well, um, it has to do with the fact that this is a branch. Uh, this has two branches, right? So um, I look at my local solution in a neighborhood of the base point here. So I can look at the solution at one, right? So I take a small open set uh, containing one and I have this uh, let's just fix one a solution. Let's say I have square root of z 
uh, is defined on this open set. Uh, and then uh, what I can do is I can analytically continue this solution onto another open set that overlaps this initial op open set. And um, I'm going to keep uh, analytically continuing these uh, solutions. So over each uh, open a circle here, I have a local solution, um, which is extending this local solution in my initial domain. And I'm just going to walk all the way around the origin until I come back to the base point. So I'm moving around the non-trivial element of my fundamental group. Right, so this generator. So I'm I, I'm asking the question, what's happening to my local solutions as I move around this element of the fundamental group. And um, so if I started with one branch of my solution, when I move around the origin, this non-trivial loop, I'll end up on the other branch of the solution. So square root of z has two branches. And so the solution that I end up if I started with f of z is equal to square root of z, then moving around this whole loop and analytically continuing the solution, I'm going to end up with, um, uh, uh, let me call it gamma, I don't know, gamma f of z. So this is what's happening when I move around the whole loop gamma, it's going to be negative square root of z. So, um, so, so, right. So I had a local solution in this uh, neighborhood. And when I moved all the way around the circle, I got another local solution in the same neighborhood. And uh, the relationship between my old one and my new one is that I'm just taking uh, negative one. Uh, multiple, taking the old one and multiplying it by negative one. So this actually defines a linear map on uh, on this vector space. So I had a vector. I had this vector space here. Um, so this is a one-dimensional vector space of local solutions around my base point, and um, I have the I have the operation that takes the local solution and uh, negates it. So uh, takes so so this is the operation on the one-dimensional vector space that sends uh, a vector to its negative. So that's a linear map, and uh, that's how this uh, non-trivial element acts on the local solutions. So that's my uh, that's my uh, one-dimensional representation of this fundamental group. It's taking a non-trivial element of this fundamental group and sending it to negative one um, because that's the linear transformation uh, that's being that acts on this one dimensional vector space of local solutions so so we started with a linear ordinary differential equation and then we got a vector space of local solutions and then we got an action of the fundamental group on these local solutions, a linear action of the fundamental group. So yeah, and we started with the one, uh, a first order linear differential equation. We got a one dimensional vector space of local solutions. And here we have a one dimensional, one -dimensional uh, representation of pi one. So that's an example of the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence going between these three uh, categories. Uh, so holomorphic connections is the word uh, that's going to play the role of linear ODEs. Uh, complex local systems is going to, uh, we can think of those as local solutions. And uh, finite dimensional representations of the fundamental group, uh, we know what those are. They're maps, they're homomorphisms from the fundamental group to GLN. Okay, so so I showed the process of how to go from this linear ODE first order to a representation of the fundamental group. 
And uh, natural question is, um, uh, so, th so this is, can, so the natural question is, can you go uh, backwards? Can you start with a representation of the fundamental group uh, and uh, realize it as the monodromy representation of some linear ordinary differential equation? So this is called uh, Hilbert's 21st problem. And it was posed. Uh, it was uh, it was posed by uh, Hilbert during uh, with his uh, famous list of problems in 1900. Uh, so this was the first uh, 21st problem. And uh, so specifically, so it's it's really going from this circle to this circle. Um, so can we start with a can we start with an arbitrary representation of, uh, of C minus finitely many points and uh, realize that representation as the monodromy representation of some linear ODE. Um, so specifically, uh, we're gonna ask for ODEs of the Fuchsian type, which an nth order ordinary differential equation where uh, the coefficients have a pole of order i at each uh, x, uh, at a pole of order at most i at each x, j. So uh, my domain is going to be c minus uh, like finitely many points. And then my pi one of d is going to be uh, the free group generated by uh, all of these loops. So it's going to be the free group uh, oops, generated by uh, th the loops that go like this. So you have, so that's what my fundamental group is. And um, can you realize uh, a repre any representation? So what is a representation of uh, this group? It's going to be an assignment where I send each of these loops to some n by n matrix. Right. right. Okay. So can uh, so we can pick those freely, and uh, that gives me a representation of this fundamental group. And the question is, can you realize this representation as the monodromy representation of some linear ordinary differential equation? Um, and we uh, we want the poles of so so these uh, these coefficients uh, functions can have singularities of order at most i at right so it, so the i uh, so this is g one and this is g n and g i can have a pole of order at most i at each point. Um, so that's one way to say a Fuchsian differential equation. Another way, uh, so this is more general than the previous one. Here, uh, my linear ODE is given by, so F is going to be an n-tuple of functions, and A is going to be an n by n matrix of holomorphic functions that have at worst a simple pole at each x j. Um, so this is, uh, you can write any ODE of this form into this form just by taking the vector f, so maybe this f uh, to be f, f bar, f double bar, f to the n. So you can uh, take you can rewrite this uh, linear ODE in this form using the, these n variables. Uh, and um, right. Okay, but this is a more general class of ODEs than this. And uh, yeah. Okay, so that's Hilbert's 21st problem. It's asking, uh, can you start with a representation of my domain? which is complex numbers minus finitely many points, and realize it as the monodromy group of some 
linear ODE where the coefficients functions uh, have poles that don't grow too fast, right? So simple poles here. Um, so, all right, so, th so that's that. So let's solve uh, the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So this, this Hilbert's 21st problem is also called the Riemann-Hilbert problem because Hil Riemann worked on special cases of this problem. And uh, Hilbert later also uh, posed the, this problem. Okay. Um, so what I want to do here is uh, solve this problem on the domain C minus zero and N equals one. So that N equals one means um, I'm looking for first order ODEs and uh, one dimensional representations. So my representation of pi one of uh, C minus zero to C star is just going to be a map, is just gonna be determined by where it takes uh, the, uh, the generator of this group too. So I can choose an arbitrary number, non-zero number in uh, in the complex numbers, uh, non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. So uh, this is my arbitrary uh, representation, one-dimensional representation of the fundamental group. And I wanna ask, is there some uh, linear ODE that has this uh, monodromy representation? And what do I mean by monodromy representation? I mean, uh, look at how this, local system of local solutions gets acted on when you uh, extend, when you analytically continue the solutions along elements of the fundamental group, right? So, 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 so up here, this, this was, a, uh, this was a linear ODE that had this as its representation where I send gamma to negative one, but now I wanna cook up an ODE that has this as its representation where you take gamma to an arbitrary um, number, non-zero complex number. So, so what should I do here? Um, how do I make an ODE? So I need a first order ODE. So, so let's start with uh, F prime is equal to, um, right? So a first order ODE looks like F prime is equal to um, some G times F. Right? So G of Z times F. And uh, G can have a pole at zero and can only have a pole of order one, at most order one at zero. So let's let's write uh, g of z as alpha over z. So so I have some flexibility here. I can choose alpha to be any number, non-zero number that I want, and uh, this is going to have a pole at zero. And so. What do we have here? We have df dz is going to be alpha zf and uh, solve this. And uh, this alpha goes out. And this is going to be alpha ln of z plus some constant C. So, so the same way as we solved it before, we have now um, F is equal to C times Z to the alpha, right? So, so, so this is my local solution. F is equal to C times uh, Z to the alpha. So this is 
again, a one dimensional vector space locally. Um, uh, it, this is a one dimensional vector space of solutions locally. And um, what is the monodromy action here? Right. So to understand that, let's, uh, right. So, so how can we find um, uh, what happens when we analytically continue the solution around uh, the origin? Um, right. So, um, so, okay, so we have uh, the va we can look at uh, the domain again. Right, so this is my point, this is my base point one. And um, I have uh, the solution in this neighborhood. Um, right. And uh, so this solution is, this is equal to, um, let's just say uh, C times. Uh, let, me, let me work with the particular solution. F is equal to, um, z to the alpha so i'm taking c equals one and uh, i can write this as e to the um, capital f of z so capital f is going to be a a um oh my bad so this should be e to the alpha times capital F of Z. So capital F is going to be a branch of this uh, logarithm function. And um, right, so I can choose my branch, I guess. I, I can choose a branch of uh, capital F um, on the complement of C minus this positive imaginary axis. And I can also choose uh, my branch to be on C minus this negative imaginary axis. Right. So I don't know. How do they say it in the book? We have uh, F. I don't know. One of them is called F mm, plus, and the other one is called F minus. So this is uh, a branch of the logarithm function. Um, and uh, in order to find the uh, right, beta, I just need to take um, uh, the value of this function at one. Um, right. So I'll take, I guess, e to the alpha uh, oh so so th th so sorry th this is going to be integral of f d z right no th this is going to be integral of g uh, DC. Okay, maybe I should have called this. Oh, come on, hold on. Sorry. Um, my solution F is going to be E to the G of C. And G is going to be um, a primitive function for G. So I think that's what it's called, right? It's, uh, it's, an, it's a possible integral of uh, of capital, uh, of lowercase g. So I, okay, yeah. So let me call this g plus and g minus. All right, so I have uh, the value at one for e to the 
g plus of one over e to the g minus of one. So what am I doing here? I'm looking at this local solution. Um, wait, maybe, so this is wrong. So this should look at g minus of one over e to the g plus of one. So I'm, so first I'm looking at e to the g minus of one. So that's the local solution over here um, with this primitive function g minus. Uh, g minus is the, just the integral of g. Um, and we're choosing a branch in this domain, uh, c minus the negative uh, imaginary numbers. And then uh, g plus is going to be a primitive function of g. And it's going to be defined in this domain, uh, which is the complex numbers minus the positive imaginary axis. And I also want that, uh, that uh, the values of g minus on the negative, uh, so on the, this half plane, and the values of g plus on this half plane agree. So you can think of this as a branch of uh, this uh, function, this a primitive function of g on this domain. And when I walk around the origin, as soon as I get into this half plane, I can switch to this function. And it'll be the same values as this one. But now here, I can walk back over here and see what the value of my function becomes at one. So this is the value of my function originally at zero, at one. And then this is the value of my function after I moved all the way around the circle, right? So I'm choosing a primitive function for G, which just means an integral of G on these two domains and having them agree on this uh, half half plane. Okay. And, and then I'm taking the ratio of the values of e to the g um, at one. Um, right. So I'm taking the so so this is the value of so if I take e to the g plus, that gives me a local solution. And if I take e to the g minus, that gives me another local solution. And I want to see what the monodromy action does when I move from this point to this point, right? And so all I have to do is take the value of e to the g plus at the point one and divide that by the value of e to the g minus at the point one. And that's going to give me the ratio, which is, uh, which is how much these two solutions changed, right? Um, if I if I looked at what was happening over here, I'm going to take the ratio of negative square root of z over square root of z, and that's going to give me a negative one, which is the representation that I want, right? So the the scaling factor is going to be what's left when I take this ratio. Wait, can you scroll back up again? Yeah. So, yeah. Where did you have beta, the multiplication? Oh, right here, gamma. I'm looking for you at gamma f of z is negative uh, square root of z. Right. So this is where you'd have that other ratio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So, so gamma, so this is notation for the local solution around one um, after I analytically continued around the loop gamma. Right. And uh, it's just the original local solution I had multiplied by negative one. Right? So I'm trying to isolate that scaling factor when I'm doing this ratio over here. Um, right. So uh, what I'm left with is going to be um, what this uh, gamma uh, loop acts on local solutions by. Right. Okay, so that's what we get 
here and then um so the so what i can do here now is this is e to the g plus at one minus g minus at one and then this is going to be e to the g plus at one minus e to the g plus i'm just going to add and subtract minus the the value at minus one so all i did was add and subtract this term so that doesn't change anything um but then um so this is uh, going to be the same as before but this g plus of negative one that's the same thing as g minus of negative one because i said that g plus and g minus agree on this half plane and negative one is in that half plane right so so this is equal to this and now uh what i have right so uh what's what's up here um this value here is going to be the integral along um let me say, let me call this gamma one and call this one, or gamma plus and call this gamma minus. All right. So this is the integral over gamma plus of little g dz, and this is the integral over gamma minus of little g dz. All right. So, so this part, uh, how do you find the integral over an arc of this function g that's holomorphic in the domain c minus zero um, you take a primitive and evaluate it at the endpoints so at this endpoint uh, i have g plus of one and at this endpoint i have g plus of negative one so that's what this integral is and this integral is uh, g minus at negative one minus g minus at one so the order of this is like that so this is the this is the beginning and this is the end so this is the end and this is yeah yeah okay and, and so that's those two integrals and then um just by the additivity of the integrals since the end point of this is the starting point of this i can say that this is e to the gamma uh, the integral over gamma of dz so just uh, what is the integral when i integrate g over just the whole gamma going over the entire loop around zero and so this is just the residue of uh, g at zero uh, so the definition of residue is so let me write it down the, the residue or one way to calculate the residue of a function g is going to be um, one over two pi i times the integral over gamma so gamma is a loop that goes around zero with winding number one and I'm integrating G. All right, so that's one way to compute the residue. And here I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm integrating over gamma of G. So, so this is going to be just E to the two pi I times the residue at zero of F of G, right? Okay, so so I I've computed uh, this, and I've seen that the action of this non-trivial element of the fundamental group acts by beta, where beta is e to the two pi i times the residue at zero of the coefficient function g, and the residue at zero is this coefficient uh, of one over z here. So the residue at zero is going to be of g is going to be alpha 
that's the coefficient of of the one over z term in this function. So that's the residue at zero. So so this is just e to the two pi i alpha. Okay. So uh, if I start with uh, this linear differential, ordinary differential equation, f, f prime equals g f, and then uh, where g is uh, this coefficient function alpha over z, then um, my action is given by beta is e to the two pi i alpha. And now the question was, uh, given any representation oops, of uh, this fundamental group, any one dimensional representation of uh, c minus zero, uh, and uh, that representation is just going to send this generator to any uh, complex non-zero complex number beta, the, uh, the, the linear ODE that I need to choose is going to be F prime equals G F, where G is alpha over Z and alpha satisfies E to the two pi I alpha equals beta. In other words, I can choose uh, alpha to be, I can choose alpha to be any number satisfying uh, beta equals e to the two pi i alpha, right? And there are uh, lots of numbers that satisfy this. There are lots of things in the pre-image of this function, uh, pre-image of beta. Okay, so, so that's the Riemann-Hilbert problem on the domain c minus zero n equals one. So I asked uh, the question, given any representation, any one dimensional representation of C minus zero, can I cook up a, a linear ODE that has this monodromy action? And the answer is yes. Uh, just take uh, F prime equals uh, alpha over Z times F, where alpha is some number satisfying E to the two pi I alpha equals beta. And beta is a number that you're assigning gamma. Okay, so that's the Riemann-Hilbert problem in this specific instance. And um, are there any questions about that? Yeah, can you scroll back down to your overview again? Oh, up here, yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. So, yeah, so, so you're on finite dimensional complex representations and... Uh, I guess holomorphic connections, your linear ODE. Yeah. But then I guess, but then from there you have the local solution. Yeah. So I described a way to go from a linear ODE to a local solution and then to a finite dimensional representation. And uh, the now, Hilbert's 21st problem was can you start with the representation and get an ODE? Right. Cool. And I just showed that in the case where my domain is c minus zero and and the dimension is one. So I'm choosing a first order ODE or a one dimensional representation, then I can do it. Right. And in general, Hilbert's 21st problem was given an n dimensional representation, can you find an, a linear ODE uh, of nth order that has a uh, pole maybe poles at m points, m different points. And uh, the growth rate of those poles is not too bad. Like, so in this, in this way to write it, you only have simple poles, or if you translate what that means in this way to write it, you have a pole of order at most i at each missing point. So we, we, we solved the problem when my domain is just C minus zero and my uh, dimension is one. And um, you can do the same idea to solve it when, when you have one dimensional representations of C minus finitely many points. So not just C minus zero, but we can choose any number of points. Um, so I worked this out. It's not in the book, um, 
but it's basically the same idea as this. Uh, you're going to have, uh, I'll just say what the answer is. It's, uh, so you have what? You have F prime. Again, you have F prime. So th since N is equal to one, uh, oh, let, let, me, let me do it like this. So we have the fundamental group pi one of D is going to be the free group generated by M loops. And any representation of this to C star is just going to assign for each gamma I, maybe I should say gamma J because I don't want to confuse it with the complex unit. Uh, gamma J, I'm going to assign some beta J. So I can do this freely. I can choose any M tuple of numbers in C star. And uh, what I'm going to have here as my differential equation is going to be the first order linear ODE like this, where my G is now going to have simple poles at each of these XMs. And what I'm going to do is have it as the sum from J equals one to M of alpha J over Z minus X J. So this guy has poles at each of these finitely many missing points. And the residue at each of these poles is alpha J. And what, what I want is that uh, alpha J satisfy uh, beta J is equal to e to the two pi i alpha J. Was N supposed to be the, the, the worst order of, the, of those poles? So you have n equals one. Yes. Um, well, uh, it's a so. If I write the linear ODE in this form, then the worst order of the poles is going to be one. Uh, so I'm going to have simple poles. Um, but if I write the ODE in this form, then translating what this sentence means is that the coefficient of the i. Uh, uh, the ith coefficient function has a pole of order at most i. I see. Right. So uh, this second way to write ODEs captures all of these ODEs, but there are more types of ODEs here. And the condition uh, of simple poles here translates to poles of order at most i up here. Okay. And these are called the Fuchsian class. Um, yeah, here I had, I still am looking for one dimensional representations of my domain C minus finitely many points. And again, Hilbert's 21st problem was about C minus finitely many points. So that's good. So this is the most general domain that we're thinking about C minus finitely many points, but the type of representation I'm looking at is a one dimensional representation. So there only one by one matrices. And uh, I can assign any numbers in C minus zero to any of these loops, right? And uh, what I'm claiming is that if I choose this ODE with this coefficient function that has residues at each uh, point that's missing, satisfying uh, that this beta J is e to the two pi i alpha J, then that works. Right, the local solutions are going to be F is equal to the product. So it's going to be a one dimensional vector space. So C is arbitrary. I'm going to have a product J equals one to M. And what are they going to look like? Instead of Z to the alpha, I'm going to have Z minus XJ to the alpha J. So that's what my local solutions are going to look like. And um, the monodromy action is actually this. Okay, so that's an example that I worked out, which is not uh, present in the text. And um, another example that is in the text is for the domain C minus zero and N is arbitrary. So now I'm actually looking at um, the fundamental group 
pi one of D, which is just cyclic generated by one uh, one loop around zero. So this is C minus zero. And this is just, uh, but now instead of one dimensional representations, I have n dimensional representations. So I can go to GLN of C. So what I'm doing is I'm taking G, I'm taking gamma, my generator, and I'm assigning to it any matrix, uh, any matrix M, any N by N invertible matrix. So the question is, is there some linear ODE that has this? Um, so I, I'm looking for some F prime is equal to A F, where F is now a vector of functions. F1 dot 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 F uh, Fn, right? Right. Um, so yeah, uh, th this is an n by n matrix. It's an n by n matrix of holomorphic functions. on uh, C minus zero. Right. And uh, so they may have uh, singularities at Z equals zero at the entries of this function, of this matrix. So I'm looking for some linear ODE like this that has, that realizes this, um, this thing, right? So what should I do? Right. What they do here is um, kind of similar to the previous things. Um, what I want is that I, wa I want to take, so I'm just reading off of the example in the text. So this is, they're going to take A equals B Z inverse. Right, so I am, so, okay, so it's kind of similar to what's happening up here. Uh, so this A is the role of G up here. G has poles at X, J's, um, right? So this has a pole at zero. So I'm taking A to be some uh, B. So it, it, was, it was just like the previous case, right? So I had G. F prime is equal to G F, where G is equal to uh, alpha over Z, right? So now um, the role of alpha, I guess, is B, and uh, we're over Z, so I have a Z inverse here. Yeah, right. So this is a matrix, and this is. Uh, this is one over Z. Um, and uh, so that's the that's what we're going to take A to be. And B is going to be some matrix satisfying. B is some matrix satisfying uh, that the exponential. So now I have to talk about the matrix exponential. So I'm going to have the matrix exponential of B is equal to M. So just like before, I wanted the residues to satisfy that uh, beta J is equal to E to the 2 pi I alpha J. And uh, down here, I'm going to have um, my local salute or my, I'm going to have my uh, uh, linear ODE to be F prime AF, where A is given by uh, B over Z, where B is, so B is like the residue, but it, instead it's a matrix. And uh, it's going to be some matrix satisfying uh, this, uh, the matrix exponential of E to the two pi I. B is equal to M, the thing that we want. Okay, so I'm not going to, uh, explain that further because it's just, I just want to say the idea of what's happening when n is arbitrary. Uh, we're going to replace uh, functions with systems, uh, n by n systems, and uh, this 
exponential gets replaced by a matrix exponential. Okay, so, um, right, that's kind of the end of section two point six. Well, uh, well, the end of the examples in section two point six. Um, I don't know. Uh, should I continue or? It's been an hour. What do you guys think? I mean, I have time. I'm, if you continue, I'm good. Um, yeah, it's up to you. I'm, I'm happy to stick around. OK, so I mean, I haven't. So if I continue, I'd be just like saying things about this correspondence, like things. That, yeah, OK, I do have some things I want to say. Um, so, so now that's, I, I guess I did the examples, right? So I did, so, so far I've did examples of uh, the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. So the examples I did were uh, D is C minus zero, N equals one, D is C minus finitely many points, n equals one and d is c minus zero and is arbitrary. Um, uh, but in general, it's uh, it's harder, I guess. So, um, so I I've I've did the exam I did the examples so far and I talked about the big picture of what's going on, but. Now, so to say more, I need to actually uh, talk about these definitions, like what's actually in each of these circles here. Um, so first, so we know what finite dimensional complex representations are. They're just group homomorphisms from the fundamental group to GLN. And so the next thing we need to discuss are complex local systems. So, so let me talk about that. So now, but before I do that, I want to review sheaves. So let me. Well, he's claiming to present a lot of this as a motivation for studying sheaf theory, right? Yeah. So historically, local systems were, uh, I guess, yeah, the first that arose. So, um, or the first of the preceding construction, which is um, the, so the correspondence between action. And, so the correspondence between locally constant sheaves of R modules and uh, representations of the fundamental group. <clears throat> or yeah, representations of the group ring, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, so um, yeah, I just want to review sheaves first, and then I can talk about local systems, um, because I did think about how to present this, and uh, there's some things I want to say about sheaves before talking about local systems. So, um, so what what is so, so when we talk about sheaves, uh, so my uh, uh, understanding of sheaves is that sheaves are kind of like our uh, covering spaces uh, viewed from below. So, right, this is what I wanted to say. So I have, so originally I have a covering space, right? So I don't know why. And uh, I project it down with a map to uh, my base space X, right? Um, so I need to know all of Y before I can say what this covering space is. So the covering space is going from the top down. And then sheaves are 
going from the bottom up, right? So I have my base space X. And instead of having this global projection going down, I have local sections going up, right? So why? And uh, what I'm looking at are these sections of this uh, covering space. So, right. So that's that's. So whenever you have a sheaf, um, you can think of it as a covering space, except uh, instead of having the whole projection map. Uh, you only have all of this, all of these little sections, right? Right. Okay. Um, right. And the sheaf axioms are just so that uh, you can glue together sections, and and so you 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 just have the axioms that you'd want these sections to have. So the the point of sheaves is that we're throwing away the covering space and just working with the sections um, we're, th we're throwing we're, we're forgetting that there is a global covering space and we're just working with sections of the covering space and uh, thinking so the se the the sections constitute the sheaf so instead of uh, instead of having a whole space lying over x I have my sheaf is built out of sections right so um, yeah, instead of having a projection map going down, I just have all of these sections and these together give me a covering space. Um, but the thing is, uh, there's a one, uh, one condition that you also need to take. So here I have covering spaces and here I have sheaves. And what I'm trying to say is that they're basically the same thing just viewed from a different perspective. So here is covering spaces. I'm looking at it from the top down and here is the same thing, which I'm looking at it from the bottom up, right? So they're the same thing, except that sheaves, uh, in order to make them literally the same, I need another condition, which is called locally constant. So, I need to specialize to locally constant sheaves to actually get uh, them to be the same notion. And uh, why is, is this, that? Is, yeah. this, is this about it's a topology here? Because with a covering space, you're starting with topological. You're with with a topological space Y. Yeah. And you don't have that here with a sheaf because you would have like some sheaf that each open set is assigned to some ring, for example. Yeah. yeah. So it's a locally um, constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, even e even if I'm just working with sheaves of sets, like I, I, I still need locally constant sheaves, right? So, yeah. Um, locally constant. So there's a condition in the definition of covering spaces, um, which corresponds to this locally constant. Uh, condition for sheaves. And that's uh, the fact that by definition, covering spaces are uh, locally trivial. And what that means is that over any small open set in my base, right? So I have X here and I have a small open set U. Um, if I look at the pre image under this uh, covering map Y, uh, P, uh, Y is the covering space. Uh, the pre-image consists of uh, of uh, the pre-image looks like uh, just the base uh, open set times some discrete set F. So F is some discrete set. Mm -hmm. So this is a part of the definition of covering space. Um, right, and. Uh, it, so this forces, when I look at the sheaf of local sections, uh, it forces the sheaf to be locally constant. So if I look at uh, the uh, sections of this guy, they're going to be locally constant. Um, yeah. Uh, 
right? So there are going to be maps from the base space to Y and they have to be locally constant because this uh, fiber is discrete. Um, so a non-example is going to be when, so I have uh, my base space is R and my uh, total space is going to be R squared with the standard topology. So I'm giving this a standard topology. And uh, the map that I'm considering is just a projection onto the x-axis. Um, so you might think this is a covering space, but it's actually not a covering space because if I take a small open set here, where the pre-image consists of the open set times R and R with the standard topology is not a discrete set. So this is not a covering space technically because it's not locally trivial. Locally trivial means in the context of topological covering spaces, uh, uh, you have the product of uh, this with a discrete set, but this is uh, U times a R, which is not discrete. So technically this is not a covering space. And if I look at the sections of this open set, uh, I'm taking maps from the open set up here and they look uh, like this, right? So they're continuous maps from R uh, or this open interval to this, uh, this plane, which commute with the projection uh, or, or uh, compose with the projection, like so, which are compatible with the projection. And uh, so these, th these are literally just functions, right? So they're functions on this open interval. So the, sh so, the, so the sections of this sort of covering space, which is technically not a covering space, are just the functions on this open interval, the continuous functions. And uh, so these are not locally constant, right? Um, yeah. So like you can see that it's not constant. But if I, if I instead had uh, R, cross uh, some discrete set with the same cardinality as R, and I think of it as a plane, right? But C is now discrete. This is going to be a covering space. And if you look at the sections, there are going to be maps from open sets to uh, up here. And uh, the sections are forced to be locally constant, right? Because if you think about it, if if it wasn't constant, if it was like just a continuous function as before, then um, since this is discrete, I can take an open set up here and, and the sections need to be continuous maps, right? So I can take an open set up here and an open set could be just this line. This is a, this is a continuous, this is an open set in this topology. And then I look at the pre-image of this open set under this continuous map F and I get a point down here, but this is not an open set. This point is not open, right? So, so the pre, so this, this, if I, if I didn't have a, if I didn't have a, if I didn't have a locally constant section, then the section wasn't continuous in the first place with this discrete topology on the fiber. So that, so th the fact that this is discrete forces forces my sections to be constant, right? Okay, right, so, so that's, so any uh, topological covering space is automatically locally constant. And it turns out that if you have a locally constant sheaf, it's also just what we call a covering space in, in this general topological notion. Um, but, these things, uh, so this is an example of what's called a, a vector bundle. Um, right, so. Right, so, th so this is an example of a vector bundle and um, yeah, th th this, is, this is technically not a covering space, but we can think of it as a sort of generalized covering space. And so sheaves allow us to talk about uh, these things as well and uh, think about them from the bottom up with sections as well um, in the same way that we think we could think of covering spaces with 
uh, a sheaf of local sections. So, so there's this more uh, general abstract thing, which is going to be sheaves. And we can sort of think of them as covering spaces, but not quite. All right. So that's, I wanted to say that about sheaves. Uh, just think of them as covering spaces. But there's a local trivial, the, the, the fact that covering spaces are by definition locally trivial forces us to be, if we want to be technically correct, we have to say locally constant sheaves. Okay. Um, and now, um, so that's, that's my rant about sheaves. Um, and now uh, let's talk about local systems. So now let's talk about local systems. So what is a local system? It's going to be a sheaf. So a complex local system. Local system is going to be a, so uh, on X. Uh, or previously we were talking about uh, on the domain D, which is a subset of complex numbers. But I'm looking at the textbook and they say X here. So let's, let's say X instead of D. Um, so a complex local system is going to be a locally constant sheaf. of uh, vector spaces, of finite dimensional vector spaces. Right? So the fact that it's a locally constant sheaf means that I can literally think of this as our usual standard uh, covering space. And uh, the, the topology on the fiber is discrete. So um, this is going to be a locally constant sheaf of vector spaces. So for each, so I have X down here, for each open set U, what I'm assigning up here is going to be a vector space, right? Um, right. So, so I have a vector space of, uh, of, uh, of uh, so, so an example of this is uh, the example that I had up before when I had a linear differential equation, right? Um, so this is uh, like an nth order differential equation if I just wanted to work with one variable, but if I work with n variables, I can write that as a matrix system like this. And this is an n by n matrix. Um, uh, give me one second. All right. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm back. Okay. So, so an example of a complex local system is going to be the solutions to this uh, to this uh, system. So actually, maybe uh, let me be more specific. Um, so if I have if I have um, uh, something that looks like this, I don't like using Y's. Okay. So if I have a uh, system, if I have a nth order linear differential equation defined in some domain D subset of C, where these coefficient functions are all homogeneous holomorphic functions on D. So this is gonna be G1 and this is Gn minus one. You see F prime plus Gn, see F plus zero. So I have uh, some homogeneous nth order linear differential equation where the GIs are holomorphic on D. Right. So uh, you have a local system 
uh, consisting of local solutions over each open subset. So for each open subset of D, I can assign to it the uh, vector space of solutions. So this is going to be a uh, vector space of solutions on D, right? So I have this linear uh, nth order differential equation and I have a vector space, an n-dimensional vector space. So this is dimension is equal to n. And the reason it's uh, an n-dimensional vector space is because um, if you look at the solutions of this guy, uh, we're taking n distinct uh, derivative, we're taking n derivatives so a solution can be obtained in some sense by taking n integrals and uh, each time you're adding in an arbitrary constant. Um, so the first time, if, you, if, I, if I had a first order differential equation, uh, I just have one arbitrary constant, but if I have an nth order differential equation, I have n arbitrary constants. So, uh, and uh, there is a general existence theorem that says if you take your domain u to be small enough, you do have an n-dimensional space of solutions. So, so for each open subset, uh, if it's small enough, I have a n-dimensional vector space of solutions. Okay, um, all right, so it, if u is small. So that's an example of a locally constant sheaf, um, right? Why is it locally constant? Um, because like, if you look at solutions of this guy, right? So it technically in the book, what they do is they think of this as a sub sheaf, uh, S is a subsheaf of the sheaf of holomorphic functions on D. Um, and uh, the fact that uh, the holomorphic functions have this sheaf property, they satisfy the sheaf axioms, so does this subsheaf. Um, so does this uh, subcollect. Yes, so does this. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, you can do the same example. Um, you have a locally constant sheaf of finite dimensional vector spaces um, for f prime equals uh, a f a solution local solutions of this. And here you're your S is going to be a subsheaf of O. So N tuples of holomorphic functions. So there's a notion of product sheaf and yeah. Anyway, so yeah, so uh, that's a, what's a complex local system. So for each open set, you're assigning a finite dimensional vector space. And since it's a locally constant sheaf, you can think of this as a, uh, as a uh, covering space. Um, so, so, eat, so if you just look at the stock of a point, of a single point, that's actually going to be uh, a vector space as well. And it's going to be the vector space of germs of local solutions. Right. Um, am I explaining this well? Do you do you see why why this is the case? Or is there any questions about? You're explaining really well, Aljamain, especially your pictures up, up above on a locally constant sheaf and covering space. What you're doing now is 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 faster than I'm, than I'm following right now, but it's, okay. it's not for lack of uh, clarity. Okay. Yeah. I'm not answering for everybody else, but 
<laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I defined the complex local system and I defined it to be a locally constant sheaf of finite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, and uh, I gave an example of this, uh, the, the sheaf of local solutions of a linear ODE. Um, and uh, what I'm saying is that the stock over a point, which you can think of as the fiber of a covering space over a point, this is also going to be a finite dimensional vector space. And it's going to have the same dimension uh, as, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, and it, it's going to consist of the germs of local solutions. Because what are sections? Section like sections are just uh, elements of this vector space, which are local solutions. So, if I look at uh, the set of sections of this open set, that's going to be a vector space, and the vectors in this vector space are going to be local solutions. They're just going to be functions on uh, U. They're just going to be holomorphic functions on U, um, which are also satisfying this differential equation. Okay. And then the germs of those uh, sections, or rather those vectors, are going to be um, elements of the stock, which is also the fiber. And if I had an n dimensional uh, space assigned to this open set, then the germ of a point is also going to be n-dimensional. And the elements of the germ or the fiber are going to be germs of these vectors here. So it's kind of confusing because I'm mixing a lot of uh, different terms. Why, why is it clear that the, the, the vector space of germs will be n-dimensional? Right, um, because if I take a basis for this, uh, the, for the sections over this open neighborhood, mm -hmm. that consists of, let's say, three different vectors here, E1, E2, E3. They're the local, uh, they're a finite basis for this complex vector space. Then if I take an even smaller uh, neighborhood inside of U, um, the same vectors, which are functions restricted to this smaller subset are also a basis for the solutions over the smaller set, right? I see. Okay. So no matter how small I have, I still have a basis of n and, and a basis consisting of n vectors. And so the germs are just the germ. Uh, the stock is is the vector space where that has a basis given by germs of these n, n vectors. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right. So so I explained locally constant sheaf. So let me go back all the way back up here. So so I talked about. Uh, Right. So what did I do today? I, I have this big picture overview of Riemann Hilbert correspondence. I gave several examples of the correspondence and I talked about the philosophy or my philosophy of sheaves and uh, which are just the inverted covering spaces. And then uh, I talked about complex local systems. Um, Right. Um, let me think. Right. I also talked about the Riemann Hilbert problem, which is also called the Hilbert's 21st problem. And uh, yeah, those were my examples. Those are kind of my examples. Okay. So, oh, oh, I, I'm forgetting one thing. Right. So, before I move on to this third circle, I want to talk about this arrow here. So like 
finite dimensional representations and uh, complex local systems, why should they be equivalent as categories? Um, right. So let's sort of uh, work this out. So this is another thing that I have to say. So you have the complex local systems. And um, so the canonical example of that is like uh, local solutions to linear ODEs. So this is this is the example that we're thinking of in mind. Uh, and it's going to turn out that these are all of the examples that we can think of because of the equivalence to the holomorphic bundle, uh, holomorphic connections, one circle up there. But uh, this is just the example that we have in mind. And we don't, right now, we don't know that all of the complex local systems arise in this way. Um, but uh, first, I want to describe the equivalence between this category of complex local systems and uh, finite dimensional representations. complex representations of pi 1 D. So, so these are complex local systems on D, and these are finite dimensional complex representations of pi 1 of D. So why are these two categories equivalent? Um, so to understand this, um, we're going to use, so what I want to do, so there's a proof uh, of a theorem in the previous section, which does in, in general. Um, so instead of complex representations, you have R modules, and, but I don't want to talk about R modules. I just want to carry out the proof up there in the case of uh, representations. So, so what's happening here? Um, so I'm kind of, uh, I need to work this out together uh, right now because I didn't write it down. So what we have here is, uh, Right, so what we want to do is uh, start with a complex local system. So I'm not going to show how it's equivalent. I'm just going to give you the, uh, just uh, just give you the functor that goes from here to here. Um, so we start with a complex local system. And my example that I have in mind is the local system solutions. And I showed you how you can go from local solutions to representations. Um, uh, but uh, let's do it with uh, complex systems. So we we know that the fiber is an n-dimensional vector space. So stock fiber it means the same thing because local systems are locally constant, right? So the fiber is an n-dimensional vector space. So okay, let me maybe draw a picture. So I have x down here. I have the fiber over this point is a vector space. And um, maybe I have a missing point here and I'm going around it. And for each point up here, I have a separate vector space, right? And so when I move all the way around, I come back here, um, I'm going to have the same vector space, but uh, so the, the stock over this point is a vector space, but uh, it's going to be transformed uh, when I move all the way around the, this loop. So how does that work exactly? Um, for that, I think uh, there's this theorem that we need to use. Uh, So, okay, so in the previous theorem, um, uh, 
we th there's a theorem that says uh you have Uh, if you have X, which is a locally simply connected topological space, and uh, you have a locally constant sheaf, sheaf of sets, uh, then uh, that category is equivalent to category of sets endowed with the left pi one action. And this uh, equivalence is induced by the functor mapping a sheaf to its stock at X. Right. So, so, um, I think I have to go back and find. Uh, so there was a theorem from a while ago, from section two point two, where we proved a that if you have a locally, if you have a connected, locally simply connected topological space, um, hold on. Oh, if you've been writing, I don't see it. Yeah, oh, no. Yeah, I've just been four. scrolling the textbook to find this specific theorem. Okay. Wait, which one? 2.2. 2. 2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, three, four, or around that area? Yeah. All right. So let me copy paste that theorem. So I have this theorem over here, which says that if you have a connected, locally simply connected topological space, X is any base point, the fiber functor induces an equivalence of, uh, of the category of covers of X to the category of left pi one sets. Right. Okay, so that's what I need. Um, so I have an equivalence of categories from uh, the covers of X to the category of left pi one sets. And then uh, in, uh, in the previous section that we just, we just went through uh, two weeks ago, we also have another theorem. Uh, right, so this is the one that uh, says that there's an equivalence. So this is actually, this is the one that I was just talking about um, between uh, there's a functor that induces an equivalence between the category of covers of X and the locally constant sheaves of X, right? So if you combine, if you combine this, which I believe Julian showed, and then this, which Connor showed, then uh, you get, uh, let me see. Uh, this theorem. So we're just combining those two theorems. So, so 2.34 plus 2 point. Uh, so both of these together give you this. So what it says, if X is a locally connected, locally simply connected, Oh, no, if X is a connected, locally simply connected topological space and you have a base point, the category of locally constant sheaves of sets on X is equivalent to category of left, uh, uh, category of sets endowed with a left action of pi one. Right. And this is the equivalence induced by the functor mapping F to its stock. Um, right. So up here, I have the equivalence between locally constant sheaves and uh, covers. And then over here, I have uh, the equivalence between covers and left pi one sets. So this theorem down here is just a composition of those two to get the equivalence between uh, left pi one sets and uh, locally constant sheaves. So I'm skipping the category of covers and just going between locally constant sheaves and left uh, pi one sets, right? Okay, and then, uh, uh, so, so now what's going to happen when my fiber is a vector space? Um, the point is that, 
right so 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 i have a category of sets endowed with the left action of pi one but now in the set here was going to be the fiber of uh of this right so this is a functor that takes uh covers to uh to pi one sets and the pi one sets are actually the fibers right and here the pi one sets are going to be the stocks but stocks are the same as fibers um, and um so now this is going to be uh, in the case of complex local systems i still have a locally constant sheaf sheaf and uh, this category of complex local systems is going to be equivalent to the category of pi one sets where the set is the fiber of this cover and the fiber we said is a vector space. So it's going to be the pi one sets where the fibers are vector spaces. So, so it's, it's going to be an action of pi one on the vector space. All we have to do now to get a representation is show that the action of this preserves the linear structure of the vector space. So what I want is that if G is in pi one of X comma X, then G of V plus W is equal to G of V plus G of W. And I want that G of uh, lambda V is equal to lambda G of V. I already have, I already have the action of pi one on this fiber from this theorem, which is a composition of two theorems we proved before. And now the last thing to do is to show that it preserves linear structure. And to actually show that it preserves linear structure, um, you kind of uh, do a trick where you take your sheaf, uh, let's say my sheaf, uh, my locally constant sheaf of vector spaces, which I'm calling a complex local system, uh, let's say it's F. And uh, what I want to do is consider the product sheaf. Uh, so there's something called a product sheaf, which just assigns to open sets the product f of u cross f of u. So you make a product sheaf, and then you make a map from the product sheaf to the sheaf itself, which is given by the linear structure. So all I'm trying to do is, to, is show that this action is actually linear action. And uh, what you can do is uh, create a new sheaf, have this morphism of sheaves. And um, uh, since, since we know that, uh, we know this theorem, which says that the category of locally constant sheaves uh, is equivalent to the category of uh, sets endowed with a pi one action. Here, I have a morphism in the category of locally constant sheaves, right? You also have to show that this is locally constant. So now I have a morphism of locally constant sheaves. And uh, via this equivalence, it should be, there should be a corresponding morphism of pi one sets, right? So I have a, the vector space, maybe say, uh, so, so actually you have to show that the fiber of this guy is actually the, the product of the fibers of these guys, but whatever. Um, so now I have, so these are going to be, this is a product of vector spaces. This is a vector space as well, but they're also pi one sets via this equivalence. And uh, because these categories are equivalent, this morphism of sheaves becomes a morphism of pi one sets here. So what I get is that my, uh, so yeah, right. Th this morphism, uh, right. Uh, right. So okay. So so this is a morphism of pi one sets. Um, right. And what does it mean for it to be a morphism of pi one sets? It means that if uh, so so this is a pi one set and this is a pi one set. So. For it to be a pi morphism of pi one sets, uh, so let's call this map. Wait, no. Let's take a sigma in pi one. 
right? And uh, what it means to be a morphism of Taiwan sets is that this map, this addition map commutes with the uh, any group element. So if I take sigma of uh, S1 comma S2, this is defined, uh, the action of pi one or on this side is going to be a sigma of S1, sigma of S2, and uh, see what happens when I move over here. Uh, this is going to be, um, right, so this gets mapped to um, sigma of sigma S1 plus sigma S2. Right, so I just took these coordinates and added them together. Um, and the fact that this is a morphism of pi one sets means that this diagram commutes. If I, if I do the map first and then do the action, that should be the same thing as doing the action first and then doing the map. So here I did the map first and then the action. And here I did the action first and then the map. And the fact that it's a pi one set means that this is commutes. And so this, I get the linearity that I wanted. Right? So I'm using uh, the equivalence of this category to get that this action on uh, this action of the fundamental group on the fiber is actually compatible with the linear structure on the fiber. And the way I'm doing that is creating this new object in my category of locally constant sheaves and using uh, the morphism of that object to my original one and passing that through the equivalence that I have. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's, uh, so, so that's why this is additive. Similar argument shows it's, uh, it's, it's homogeneous, so it's scalar. You can pull scalars out. So this is actually a linear action. And so that's, uh, that's what we're doing here. We're taking a local system and uh, getting a finite dimensional complex representation. And the fact that these, uh, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we're just taking this previous equivalence and upgrading it to an equivalence where the pi one sets are actually pi one representations. And yeah. So that's uh, that equivalence. Um, okay, is that good? Oh my God. <clears throat> All right. So, so let me summarize what we've done again. So, uh, this is the picture I, I talked about this so far, right? So I've done most of the work now. Um, oh, well, actually there's this circle, right? So now I have to talk about holomorphic connections. 